Hi, thank you many. Hello everyone. So, I'm here to talk about the decentralized politics of Bitcoin. Right? It's a nice title that I picked up. You can tell me after if it matches the content of what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, we, we know the blockchain, we know Bitcoin, it's, it's math-based currencies, as some people like to call it. It's open source. It doesn't know politics, right? It, it knows how to transfer bitcoins from point A to B to point B. It, don't cons it knows it, uh, it has the meaning of consensus and, and double spending and, and all these uh, mechanisms. But there's really no politics in the bitcoin uh, architecture itself. However, uh, we are using bitcoin, right? We humans are using this this technology and we're introducing our own politics into it. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, places where, where uh, this, this interaction, this politics can, uh, can, uh, can be seen. Peter Todd uh, spoke about this uh, a few months ago uh, on, on some aspects, I will speak about it others. Uh, there are of course mining pools that are a big concern to some, you can see here uh, uh, you know, one mining pool uh, gaining half of the, all of the of all of the hashing power uh, just uh, recently. We have the, the development of uh, Bitcoin Core, where you know some people say that the developers have too much power. You have all these altcoins and, and new uh, Bitcoin 2.0 communities that, that come and, and compete in, the, in this space. And you have the regulators and, and that sort of uh, politics involved. So my, I, I will focus on, on mostly on the last point uh, and what, what do regulators want? So regulators, of course, want nothing to change, right? They're, they know sort of they know their business. They know what to do with fiat currencies, and we, we're forcing them really to to understand what Bitcoin is, right? Three years ago, no regulator cared about Bitcoin. They didn't really it wasn't significant enough for them to to interact with. But now, as Yoni mentioned, you know, top bankers are uh, discussing it. Uh, of course, all the different regulators in, in different countries or around the world. And uh, the topic is there. They have to, to form an opinion. Now, uh, regulators, of course, you know, they want to, to preserve the status quo. They want to prevent abuse. They want to see consumer protected. Uh, they don't want uh, exchanges like Mt. Gox Robbing, uh, robbing their customers basically. They, they want to prevent money laundering, so they have all these valid concerns. But uh, and, and they're trying really to, to understand how to apply the existing laws and how to transform them to allow innovation in their own jurisdictions, but still regain some so, some level of control. And of course, they want to be relevant uh, to the discussion. We see you know, in New York uh, that the regulators there sort of make a, make a stand on how Bitcoin should be regulated and there are some, some who say that, uh, I forgot the name of that regulator, but there are some who say that you know, they want to, to do it just to be seen, right? That just to be seen as a place of authority just to, uh, and, and because other, other countries, other regulators all turn to the US, all to, turn to New York as sort of the capital of the financial markets today. So there is always this question uh, being asked, can you even regulate Bitcoin? And, and the answer is, you know, you cannot regulate the protocol, the protocol does as the protocol does. You would have to shut down the entire internet to regulate Bitcoin, which isn't something that I, I think would happen. But you can regulate the endpoints. You can regulate wallets, exchanges, retailers, and, and in some places even users, right? You know, countries, uh, some countries like China, Russia, uh, prohibit or, or say they prohibit and they, they go back, but they, they force all these kind of restrictions on, on the various endpoints in the ecosystem. And of course, beyond all, all the money the money laundering issues, the regulators do want their the, the, the taxman wants their due. And you know some people dream they can use Bitcoin as an unregulated unregulated tax haven, and maybe maybe that's possible. But you probably won't be able to sleep well at night, right? The taxman will always get his due, and we see that even in cases such as Silk Road, you know, they, they get you in the end. So it's better to know really what what the regulation is, how to work with it, uh, what you can do, can't do, and then how much taxes you should pay. 
And, and the question to that isn't clear at this point. And it, it depends on the region. So the regulators all around the world are basically competing with each other. Right? If, if the world had one single government, then maybe, maybe Bitcoin wouldn't even have happened at all. Right? That government could have just shut Bitcoin down, set laws against it, and, and that would have been the end of it, maybe. But luckily, we don't live in, in a centralized world, in centralized regulation. We have different countries, different laws, and, and which are competing with each other. Right here, I put some of the, of the countries that are more friendly to Bitcoin. You see uh, Canada. I consider the US as friendly to Bitcoin, relatively, although it has some inherent problems that just stem from the fact that the US isn't a single jurisdiction, it's 51 different jurisdictions. Uh, so that's a problem that they're actually trying to tackle with. Uh, and, and a few more, a few more. And we have countries which have different regulation, uh, or difficult regulation for Bitcoin. I mentioned China, Thailand, uh, I don't remember all of these by heart, but as we see it's, it's very uh, different by country by country and month by month this, this thing changes. Uh, BitLegal uh, was the first uh, really uh, place that centralizes or lists the different regulations uh, per country. You can go to this website and, and just check out a particular country that you want. You will get all the latest information on on regulatory uh, practices for exchanges, for users, for retailers, uh, the tax information, whatever you can find there. It's not always updated, but we're actually working, uh, I'm not a part of Big Legal, but uh, we're trying to improve it and, and make it more uh, updated. They have a, a program where uh, they have a representative per country that is responsible for, for updating and maintaining the relevant information. Uh, and basically, basically, this is the sort of preamble or, or reason why we need Bitcoin organizations, right? We, we, for, we saw the first Bitcoin organization uh, arise about two years ago as, as the Bitcoin Foundation, and, and by now we have dozens, if not more, organizations all around the world just dealing with these regulators, with, with these local regulatory issues. Now, the Bitcoin Foundation does a bit more, I'll get into that later, they also sponsor the core developer or some of the core, core developers, but beyond that, we believe, and I here represent both the Israeli Bitcoin Association and the Global Bitcoin Alliance, we believe that there is room for dialogue with regulators and which we aim to provide a, a contact point to aggregate, aggregate this information, both when, when regulators want to know the latest development in Bitcoin and when companies and individuals want to know what the latest from the regulator is. So, this is a function that uh, a lot of individuals around the world felt is or feel that is necessary, and for this they just uh, form, uh, concentrate and form these different organizations, different non-profit organizations throughout the world. Um, and there is always the, this case of contention, right? Do, do, does the Bitcoin Foundation represent the Bitcoin users? Does the Israeli Bitcoin Alliance represent the Israeli Bitcoin users? Well, the answer is no, we don't represent everyone, we can't represent everyone, but we represent those that want us to, to represent them, basically. We represent our, mem our members. We, we try to, to make Bitcoin more accessible, and more, more widespread in Israel, that, that is our agenda and our goal, but you know, we, there can be other 10 different competing organizations, and, and, that, and, and there can be people who don't belong to any organization, and that's completely fine. We're just trying to do what we think, can, can promote this, uh, this agenda. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll say a few words about the Bitcoin Foundation. It was really the first uh, prominent Bitcoin organization, founded uh, two years ago by Gavin Andreessen, Charlie Schrem, Mark Carpellis, if you ask who remember Vox, and, and a few others. Uh, and its mission statement was really to standardize, protect, and promote the use of, the, of Bitcoin. Uh, and they, they were doing it, and in the first year, uh, year and a half, they focused a lot on really the U.S. engagement with U.S. regulators. Uh, they got a cease and desist letter from the U.S. government, or not from the government, from, from FinCEN or one of the other organizations, to which they, they really uh, wrote a well thought out retort. Uh, so they're engaging in that front, and they're also doing a very important role, which is funding the development, as we, as we know, the, the, the development of Bitcoin really isn't done by a company. There's no Bitcoin.com company that 
that sponsor this, uh, this organization. Uh, and so it's important that the core developers who are working a lot on this multi-billion multi system get funding from somewhere. Up until now, really, the Bitcoin Foundation has done uh, its part in that, and this is actually the original reason why I joined personally as a member of the Bitcoin Foundation is because I want, they started paying Gavin's salary, and I, I thought he was doing a good job, and I wanted to, to promote that. And uh, right now there are other alternatives. Uh, Mike Heron is working on Lighthouse, which is a decentralized way to sponsor the development of, of certain Bitcoin features, uh, and it's good to have these alternatives. Uh, but I think that still it's, it's important to have the other function of the Bitcoin Foundation, which is engagement with regulators and education, which a decentralized system such as this Lighthouse is maybe less equipped to do. So, right, uh, the Bitcoin Foundation started by engaging Gavin as chief scientist, and, and now uh, they sponsor a few more developers. They don't own the development team, as uh, of course to some, people, uh, some people's opinion. It's not like what the Bitcoin Foundation says goes straight into the protocol. There, there, there is still room for discussion and debate, and I believe there are still some core developers not employed by the Bitcoin Foundation, but just self-employed or employed by other companies, which is good. Uh, and I, I do want to say something about the chapter and affiliate program that they're uh, doing. So the, the Bitcoin Foundation has started, really, they started as a, as a US-based organization, but they really want to be a, a unified brand across the world to sort of represent the, the local authority. And for this, they, they basically go and outreach and do an outreach program to different countries and, and bootstrap uh, their uh, local organizations under the, this brand, the Bitcoin Foundation brand. Uh, we were in talks with them, the Israeli Bitcoin Association uh, was started about a year ago, and we were in talks with them on, on various forms of cooperation, but right now we're proceeding as a separate organization. Uh, and this leads me to the next point, the Global Bitcoin Alliance. Uh, I said it's uh, decentralized politics, right? So everybody's doing their own thing, and, and our take on how to really spread Bitcoin worldwide and how to, to foster the engagement of these local leaders is via a more loose, uh, more loose network. So the Global Bitcoin Alliance is a network of local organizations. Everybody who's already doing work on Bitcoin at a local level can join the GBA. Uh, we don't have any membership fees, any, any contract, it's very simple. We're just a bunch of local organizations uh, that are communicating with each other. We have a Skype group, a Google group, and we have monthly meetups where the different organizations exchange information. And uh, we, I think we have about 15 or more countries, and uh, with new countries and uh, new organizations uh, joining every month or two. Uh, so we're really seeing a positive trajectory here, and uh, I think that the, the GBA forms uh, an important uh, role. Uh, just connecting these uh, uh, organizations and, and establishing the information flow. Because a lot of, you know, when we started, uh, when the Israeli Bitcoin Association started, we were curious about what was going on in other countries, who are the, the representatives, or, you know, not the official representative, but were even the different groups working in Germany, in Canada, and all these places, and there was no place to, to combine them and to aggregate them. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, the purpose of the GBA. Uh, again, it's founded organically, there's no central uh, management, really, there's not a lot, you know, we don't do a lot. You, you, Bitcoin Foundation, you hear about them uh, a lot, they, you know, they, they sponsor development, they organize, they organize big conferences. We're more loose, we're just, uh, we're just uh, foster uh, the communication between the different organizations, that's our primary objective. And we do have some other projects that we're looking at, uh, one of them is uh, perhaps supporting uh, BitLegal that I mentioned before. But uh, you know, maybe we'll make some more noise next year. All right, uh, a few more organizations that I'm, I'm showcasing. Basically, my, my presentation is just a showcase of the different organizations that I see. Uh, Bitcoin Association is one of the alternatives to, to Bitcoin Foundation. Uh, it was started, uh, I think, only also in, in the US, but they're spreading worldwide. Uh, and, and they're really quite similar in, in their agenda. I mean, all of these organizations. All of these organizations, or most of these organizations, you know, we, we want to help Bitcoin grow, we want to provide information, we want to communicate, and it's just different people have different takes on, on what it takes to, to do this, and how to do this right. So 
So I'm not going to quote all the mission statements for the different organizations. Um, data is, uh, is a bit different from the other groups that I mentioned. As, uh, it's an industry group uh, that's basically focused on, on the different companies that uh, they want to be regulated, all the exchanges, all the payment processors, they want to know how to comply with regulation, but the regulators haven't told them which regulation they should comply with. Right? They're mostly silent or you know, they're taking their sweet time. So data has formed as a self-regulating body. Where, where they, basically they, they sat down, they thought of what are the best practices for, for Bitcoin companies to, to engage. And, and, and then, if you're a member of DEGA, then you agree to follow these set of practices. And the aim of DEGA is to, to get some sort of official recognition from the relevant regulators in the US and in other places. Uh, so basically, they want their, their self-regulated uh, practices to become deregulation in the future. I think that's their aim. And another organization I want to talk about, uh, which is a bit less known than the others, is it's Cripsa. It's, uh, it's rather new compared to the others. So Cripsa are, you can think of Cripsa as the extension of the payment protocol. Right? Uh, maybe some of you know, there is uh, in the recent uh, Bitcoin uh, versions, I think it was 0 0.9, uh, the protocol started in, on incorporating a payment protocol where you don't just send Bitcoins from point A to point B, but you also get a receipt and you know who you're paying to and all these sort of advanced features. So Crypto are taking this, this idea to the next level and they have a whole set of features around advanced uses of money uh, which, which will underline Bitcoin as its core technology. And this is their, their standard. They're developing a, an open set of standards to facilitate the, these usages. Uh, the, another organization is the College Crypto Network. They uh, really made a lot of uh, a lot of head, a lot of news uh, in the last half a year. Uh, that's uh, an organization of, of basically Bitcoin adoption in colleges. Uh, it started by a few uh, members of a few prominent uh, colleges in the states and has spread worldwide. Uh, and you know this is the this is the place where we'll probably see the most you know the most adoption. Right? It's the earlier generation. It's the students. And, and uh, College Crypto Network is dedicated to bringing crypto adoption to colleges. We've seen some amazing progress done over the last six months. Uh, I, I don't know how much of that to attribute to, to this specific organization or not, but we've seen some things in MIT where they're giving away, I think, 10 bitcoins per, per student, just as a way to, to quicken the adoption. We've seen other, other colleges just adopt bitcoin as a means of payment. Uh, or the local, uh, the local college store or local university store for equipment and whatnot, except Bitcoin. Uh, so I think that really it's a good crowd to, to foster the adoption. And of course, the, there are also Bitcoin courses that are being developed in various places. And, and you know, people are asking, I just saw, just this morning I saw somebody ask from Quora on a, on a Q&A website. They asked, I'm a graduate or I'm an undergraduate student interested in cryptocurrency, which projects should I work on? Right? So there are these untapped minds that want to work on, on interesting problems related to cryptocurrencies and I think that this organization will help uh, coordinate that and uh, turn that into good use. Uh, finally, of course, I'm, I'm representing the Israeli Bitcoin Association. I'm not sure if many mentioned it or not, but this entire conference is co-organized with the, the IBA where you know, we're a young organization, we started about a year, year and a half, year and a half ago, and, and we're, all, we're doing all these things, right? We're uh, organizing conferences and meetups, and, and really many personally has a lot, uh, you know, we all need to thank him for his work uh, in the last few years uh, doing this stuff, because he's, the, he's, doing, he's dedicating his full time to this, I'm just uh, contributing a bit when I can. Um, so we were, we're organizing conferences, we are engaging regulators, there, there was a Actually, the regulators in Israel are uh, discussing every week now. They have a committee that, that uh, meets and then talks about Bitcoin. So a couple of members from us uh, attended there and so sort of gave them our feel on, on how Bitcoin works and what, why, should, why Israel should adopt it. Uh, or uh, you know, at least tell us what the right regulation to follow should be. Uh, the Israel Bitcoin Association started uh, sort of a an organization that didn't have a really solid uh, 
Well, we have a board of director, directors that was sort of self-elected because you know we had to bootstrap somewhere, but we're working towards. Uh, we we have an election coming up in uh, next month, so or in two months, so please join and vote. Uh, so again, I'm getting signals that I need to finish. <laughs> So uh, just a few words, we have a Bitcoin embassy, which is just a local physical place where Bitcoin uh, meetups can happen. And we have, uh, this is the picture of the embassy, you're all welcome to come. And Bitcoin Spaces is, is a new thing, that maybe I'll talk about later, which is a network of such embassies all around the world. So this is what I have. Thank you very much.